Are you smiling the whole time? No, just good. I, like, <laughs> I need to look at you. It's creepy, man. I laugh sometimes, and then I'm like, all right, I gotta keep this smile on, on your face. <laughs> So remember guys, we announce these workouts each week and we invite all of you to do the workout with our on-site community. We're doing it a week ahead of time so you guys can get some tips, strategies, all of that, and we put a warm-up in the description for you. Max, are you the one that's announcing the workout today? I am. Let's do it. This week's throwdown is written by Becky. 15-minute AMRAP, 75 cals, 55 cals as a buy-in. In the remaining time, 15 lateral burpees over the rower, 12 Double dumbbell power snatch, 50, 35, nine bar muscle ups. Standards. So every lane will be set up exactly like this. The rowers will be at the same distance, so everyone has to walk the same amount. Every movement you have to face out. So for the bar muscle ups, no running up to it and facing here. Everybody faces out for all the bar muscle ups. The row is pretty straightforward. Set it on a countdown. So 50, you can do cow countdowns on all these monitors, right? Yes, okay. So set the cow countdown to 75 or 55. You can't come out of the rower until you actually hit zero. So when you get one, you can't start taking your feet out. Get all the way to zero, get out of the rower. For the burpees, two foot takeoff, or two foot hop back, two foot hop back up, and a two foot takeoff. So none of this for jumping over. The dumbbell snatch, one head has to touch the ground and it has to be locked out overhead and they can't be clean and jerks. So they have to go from the floor all the way overhead in one motion. So this week we got a special treat for you since it is games prep week. We got Josh Miller and KT Trombetta, two games qualifiers that are gonna demo this workout. Before we get there, yep. we wanna talk about some separation value and how we can kind of create a better system in place that you guys can start thinking about to improve your scores on qualifier style workouts. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think like every workout, pacing, pacing, pacing. Right. It's always gonna be the common theme. So. The major one, I think, to start this is the row that's up front as a buy-in. It's a buy-in. Yeah. And it's a big portion of the workout. For most people, it's going to be somewhere between three and five minutes. So yep. it could be up to a third of the total workout just in that row. Yeah. One of the things that I told my athletes, you know, everybody sees a buy-in and like, I got to get done quickly because then I, I need to get as many rounds as possible yeah. after that. But the reality is it's still a 15-minute AMRAP. There's a clock on. And so I told them to treat it like a 15-minute row but with one exception, to start out a little bit hotter than you would like and then pull back after 15 to 20 cals. And the reason that I did that on site was because then you can kind of start to look around and know where you're at compared to the field. We had the rowers pretty close. Yeah. So one of my athletes, I said, hey, just start a little bit hotter than you want and then at 15 or 20 cals, back off to your 15 minute pace and then watch other people kind of start racing because that's he wanted to win his heat and then from there, let's say you get to 60 cows, you need to kind of pull back a little bit, then he could pull back, but he wouldn't lose any time to the field because he was already ahead. So it's really a racing game from that point. And then once he gets onto the AMRAP, that's kind of when you figure out your new pace for the, yeah. the other movements. I like that model for thinking about the row as a 15 minute segment, even though it's only gonna be three to five minutes. Right. When people go after it and they look at these workouts in chunks and they think, oh, I'm gonna get this 75 or 55 cows done in this time, and they're not factoring in, okay, well, if I get like really out of breath and my diaphragm's a major spine stabilizer and now I have to hop up and hinge doing all of my burpees to jump over, then I have to double hinge to, or hinge again to do all of these uh, double dumbbell power snatches and then I need to stabilize my midline to do bar muscle ups, a little bit of redlining yourself on that row could have really dramatic consequences in the overall workout. Yeah, I saw that from a couple of my athletes. They went on a little yeah. too hot, yeah. and then they were already like messed up by the first set of burpees. And it, you know, by that point, you have 11 minutes left in the workout or yeah. more. And so, if you're redline at that point, obviously you're gonna you're really deteriorating towards round two, three, and, and four yeah. if you get there. So then, outside of the row, the other two things we kind of talked about was you're either going to be limited by the bar muscle ups or limited by just like overall fitness and particularly the dumbbell power snatch. So how do you look at that? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's just a good way to kind of split people into two groups. If you are limited by the bar muscle ups, but you can get through them, then it's gonna be a matter of figuring out all of your rest breaks and all of your strategy to make the impact of whatever your limiter as lessened as possible on all the other stuff. So if you know like the dip out of your muscle ups is gonna go, then you probably wanna have some sort of a strategy in your burpees where you're not pushing up as fast. Maybe you start to snake your burpees. If you know that your grip starts to go, then doing the double dumbbell power snatches, you wanna make, might 
break up into more sets with quick breaks to try to keep some of the tension off so that you can take advantage of the skill that you're going to be most limited in in the workout. Because if you are going to have to do singles on those nine muscle ups, you're going to lose a lot of time relative to people who are good at them. Yeah. I think like any workout, as an athlete, you have to look at it beforehand and say, hey, where are my limitations in this workout and where can I make up some time? And then kind of pace the workout or talk to your coach if you have one about how to get around the movement that is your bottleneck. And so for most people, again, it may be the bar muscle ups, but then it may mean that you have to change your burpee pace or cadence, change the way that you break up the power snatches. Or for some people, the elites that we saw, the power snatches became a limitation just because most, some, some of the guys and girls were going unbroken on most of the sets, which is really impressive. Most people can't do that. So it's like, how do I make up time by taking shorter breaks and then getting the bar muscle ups a little bit faster? Yeah, I think that segues nicely into the final, like just general pacing guideline here is that general fitness as a limitation and that could be we're saying general fitness but it could be that like your burpee technique's not efficient or that the dumbbell power snatch with double dumbbells isn't something you practice a lot or just doing 15 minute high power conditioning workouts isn't something so you got to figure out whatever your pacing strategy is whether it's going to be like bigger chunks of work with a little bit longer rest, short chunks of work with short, fast rest, bursts on the burpees, doing like five really fast and a quick break, and then five really fast. There's a lot of different ways that you could skin the cat, but you gotta figure one out for you to bypass whatever your biggest fitness limitation is. Let's go ahead and watch Josh and KT do this, and then we'll get back to you with some long-term tips. All right, so after the demo, stick around. We'll show you the scores of the rest of our on-site training group, but we are about to begin. So the guys did 75 cals, the ladies are doing 55 cals. You got Josh and KT right next to each other. Yep. I like the way Josh started. I think he kind of went with a little, a quick sprint start, being a little more aggressive, and then he definitely pulls back, which is one of the things we talked yeah. about a minute ago. Yeah, so you can't see the actual monitor right now. I know I walked around. All the guys in this heat were pulling, oh, maybe Chris is going to be here. We'll see. It's moving too slow to know, though. <laughs> uh, they were all, like, around high 1,400 cals yeah. per hour for almost the entire thing. Um, did you happen to see what the girls' paces were? I know in this heat, I was watching uh, Trav, Noah, Chandler down on the other side. and Yeah, I watched around. one of my athletes, Allie DeRoma, um, pace her row, and she was about 11.50. She's okay. a, she, she was the first off the row. She's a really good row, but she scaled. She had a, a huge rip in her hand, so she just did strict yeah. pull-ups. So but it still gives workout. a context for what yeah. the pace on the yeah. rower should be. Uh, a different workout for her, so she was a little more aggressive than probably she would have been on the row, but um, I think 1150 is probably where you're going to see the, the best female athletes for the 55 cows. Yeah, what were, do you remember the ex- uh, around the times that they were getting off? So the ladies were off just a little bit before the guys, uh, probably about 305 to 310 yeah. um, for the best scores, and then the guys were 315 to 320. Yeah. Some of them were a little bit faster than that, but I said that would be kind of the, the average of most of the, the games qualifiers. Yeah. And the thing is, I mean, look, like all of those guys and girls could go a lot faster than this, but they're thinking about how many rounds can I get because the score was just total reps at the end and not, it would have been different if it was row score, total time, and two in AMRAP. Yeah, it's crazy that like a little adjustment to that, just to the scoring profile, will change your workout so much. And the overall score of round times would probably drop pretty dramatically if you did have to go... 75 or 55 at max effort. To I actually would love them, to see this the is difference. just one workout in their day, right? Yeah. yeah. Did y'all yeah. mention that? Yeah, there so this whole group you see that whole line um, down when Chris is at the side profile view. This they did uh, three workouts on Friday as the start of the games prep camp and then this is their first workout on Saturday and then they did two other actual scored workouts and then a full 45 minute strength session that had four different components in it. So I mean, as always, I'm super impressed with just the volume tolerance and the ability to dig in workout after workout after workout. I mean, I do like one max effort Metcon and yeah, I'm yeah. done. Not to mention there's a there's a a mental factor to this when you're competing with others that are competitive with you. Yeah. It's different than going hard in your own gym when you're beating everyone, but now it's like, you know, these two are racing each other and racing all the other games qualifiers that yeah. are in the heat. Yeah. Um, it definitely takes a little bit of a mental toll. Yes. And some psychological, I mean, it's not like psychological warfare, but it definitely is like confidence building or confidence yep. breaking, knowing that these are going to be your actual competitors at the CrossFit Games. Yeah. So here's KT off or Katie that off, she's doing her burpees. 
Um, just got a nice little technique here. You can kind of see like at the best athletes, they have that ability to kind of stay hinged and low with their upper bodies and never stand all the way up. I tried to do this and I try to replicate it, but it's definitely difficult yeah. for, for me. This and was one of the tips I was gonna say in the video. I wanted to wait for this because you saw both of them do a pretty good job. KT does a better job than yeah. Josh. Josh is just really fast at burpees, so yeah. he can stand up. But if you watch the best in the sport, they stay very low. Uh, if you remember like, um, the 16-4 workout was burpees yep. and, and the thrusters. Five, that, I think. Or was it, oh, 16-5, yeah. that's right. Everyone that won that workout or that was in the top 10, they all are just so smooth and low on their burpees. It saves a lot of time and energy because you're not having to extend every single rep to jump. Yeah. Obviously, it is a little bit of a break if you stand up, so I think you need that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just also a posture that people are more regularly breathing in. For so sure. you can kind of regulate your breathing a little bit easier there. But yeah. um, it's definitely, like Josh has fully stood up on the other side of all of his burpees. We don't have a, a, a counter like somebody else to show next to it. But um, I've done some side-by-side -side screen grabs of people doing burpees that are like that and then burpees where you stay low. And you could, on a, on a bar-facing burpee, save up to like a full second per rep yeah. just by having appropriate footwork and not standing all the way up. Travis and I actually ran through this before yeah. the workout this year with bar muscle ups and burpees and just to, to see the difference and staying yeah. low obviously it's a huge difference maker in, in time. So this is the muscle snatch technique that Josh is doing right now, KT's head um, that you were talking about though. Yeah. I mean, look, this, when you pick up dumbbells and you haven't done this movement before, that feels the most natural. It, it feels like, okay, I can get some power through my hips, my shoulders are strong enough that I can press it out. But if you can start to learn other techniques, there may be one that's a little bit more efficient. And in my opinion, if you have a good shoulder position, the dip at the top is more efficient and it actually saves some time. You can actually go faster with it, believe it or not. I think people think the muscle snatch is faster with the dumbbells, but it, it's not, um, especially when you're talking about 12 reps at a time. Uh, but that's one of those things that you have to start practicing in your training. So again, you know, I'll give them to people and say, hey, try these three different techniques, report back on how long 15 unbroken take for time yeah. and what the perceived effort is, and then allow people to kind of dictate how they pace after that. Yeah. So Josh just did his bar muscle ups unbroken and his dumbbell power snatches unbroken. Katie had a pretty good lead. I mean, I know I'm not racing one another, but it just gives some context for how you could how you could strategize for yourself. Katie yeah. took a break in the bar muscle up, so I'm assuming I didn't talk to her, she's coached by Adam, like what her strategy was and what her major limitation was gonna be. I also didn't talk to Josh before the workout because Kyle coaches him. Um, but just watching two different athletes approach the same workout with different strengths and weaknesses and how they kind of navigate, what's the best way for them to get the best score out of this workout? Yeah. And it's not always going to be the same. There's no like optimal strategy. Right. And that's one of the things that we said before, right? Like you have to figure out where your limitations are. And for them, their, the, their limitations are way different than probably the, the most people that are doing yeah. the workout. But they also still have something that's going to blow them up more than yeah. other movements. And they have to learn how to pace those things. One thing I, I noticed that Josh is doing here, so it's lateral over, but if you look at his footwork, when he starts to jump over, he starts to kind of face the rower. I've noticed that for me, the lateral jump, even though it's the same, like, you know, it's still the only like six or eight inches, yeah. coordinating the lateral jump and dropping right down into the burpee was just so much more fatiguing. I don't know if it's just because I haven't practiced as much lateral bounding or whatever, but if you could figure your footwork out to be facing or diagonal to the rower a little bit and then do a little half rotation or something to get you back square to go into the next burpee, it does reduce the difficulty of the jump pretty yeah. substantially. This was, uh, I actually have done some, some testing on my own with this, just trying to see how fast lateral burpees can be and where like an efficient pattern would look, what, what it would look like. And staying lateral is faster if you have the coordination to do it, but I think most people don't, exp like think about doing burpee lateral box jump over to something. Most people like get freaked out yeah. by it because they're like, I don't know if I can land on the box. So then you're like, it's, it's almost psychologically taxing because you're trying to coordinate the movement patterns. Yeah. So it is again, a thing that you need to practice. But I think that if you can find a 45 degree angle or do lateral, it's a little bit faster. Yeah. Um, so we're a movement behind because they're on bar muscle ups. But as I was watching them do those dumbbell power snatches, um, I noticed a lot of 
spine flexion, like people bending over to get the double dumbbells down. Whereas with a barbell, you know, it's kind of elevated off the floor with the plates and you can kind of have the set back angle a lot more easily. What do you think is the optimal way to coach that? Or like, should people be out of flexion? Is there certain movements where it's okay? Cause you know, when you go into a pistol and you have to bottom out the pistol, like you're generally gonna get some yeah. of that pelvic tuck under. I know some people sometimes worry about trying to have that tight, perfect back angle. Yeah. You think it's a problem or something people should just be aware of or what? You know, it's funny because I see like a Travis do this and he doesn't have a tight spine, but he's he might have the strongest positions yeah. <laughs> in the bottom that I've ever seen. So I don't really know. Yeah. I don't know how, what your thoughts are on that, but I, uh, I've i done a lot of breathing work with people that do have like bad hinging patterns where they do hinge in like a 90 degree and then even further and yeah. further down um, or maybe like some seated straddle hinge work where they're breathing and, and try to get comfortable. Um, I've seen some success with that, but a lot of it, for, especially for the higher level athletes, I think, again, is just exposure to the movements. It's yeah. just like any sport. Like, I'm not comfortable, I love playing a lot of golf, I'm not comfortable out of the rough chipping. Well, you gotta go out there and practice and find a technique yeah. that's gonna work for you. Yeah, and I think a lot of that, too, just to throw in, I guess, my perspective, is is based on how your body is built. So if you have, like, short arms and you gotta hinge all the way yeah. down to the ground, you might eventually get to end range hip flexion and not have anywhere else to go. So you have to kind of figure out some sort of a rounding position to get into. And then you have to lo slowly load that over time to make sure that your back does stay safe. So yeah. I don't think there's an optimal way to do any movement specifically, but there is definitely gonna be an optimal way for you to find a technique that works for you that can sustain volume, can sustain heavy loads, can sustain uh, high speeds, and once you find that, that's the one that you want to refine. Yeah, and there's some ways that you can train it. For people that have bad hinging patterns that need to bend their knees more, I'll actually use a trap bar and uh, stack some plates so it's almost a deficit trap bar where they yeah. are at a 90 degree hinge, plus a knee bend. So you're creating like a hinge and a flexed position yeah. and then just do you know reps at you know wh whatever load that you're trying to target. Yeah, you can see, so in this round, and I know for myself as well, these dumbbell snatches got hard. Yeah. Um, two little technical things I noticed here. So Katie kind of keeps her arms bent on the way up and down. You can see her all the way at her bottom. She's got a little bit of bend in her elbow, whereas Josh is a little bit more straight armed. I think optimally, if you're trying to keep tension out of your arms, just to, you know, cause you're putting stress on your arms when you're doing burpees from pressing, obviously hanging from a bar is gonna be high tension in your forearms and your biceps, just to do the straight arm pull before you go into your muscle ups. If you can have a more straight arm and a more relaxed grip, I do think that would save you some energy, but that might be a long-term development thing yeah. and not necessarily something you could just like coach and do in the moment. I asked a couple people what their thought was when they were doing them and, and probably I've said majority of people that were good at them talked about it as like almost like a, a kettlebell swing with, yeah. with dumbbells. Yeah. So that is a more straight arm position. Um, but again, I mean, I think obviously her arms are a little bit shorter. She's yeah. pretty powerful in her hips. Yeah. I think she's kind of trying to pop up and treat it like almost like a real barbell snatch where you are pushing your elbows back. Yeah, and her gymnastics are obviously not to the point where she's going to failure as a result yeah. of using her arms, but it might just be like a little efficiency thing people can be aware of and then adjust for themselves moving forward. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know what that means, guys. It's time for our TTT dance break. <laughs> <laughs> I Chris is saying I hate this. Yeah, Chris is actually <laughs> dancing on camera. Yeah. Can I turn go, it around? Go. Uh, Give me a fist yeah. pump. You can, do you have a dad dance? Yeah, yeah. there you go. This oh is man, me. the silly I'm dance. A refrigerator in <laughs> social situations. <laughs> Just yeah, move. We should have a dance party Sit here. Still. <laughs> Don't move. Uh, Partially, that's just not sweat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I walked in the gym yesterday. It was like 9 a.m. and still 70 degrees, and you were just soaked. I was like, did you work out? No. Yeah. Just been standing here. <laughs> what is wrong with My him? body is a furnace. <laughs> I can't help it. All right. What, what's the time on this right now? Uh, so, so we're about we're 12 about, minutes in. Yeah, so they're going to be – they're in round four right now. They probably have somewhere between two and a half to three minutes. You should have a clock on your screen so you know, but – we're watching the actual raw footage and don't have that up yet because our media Roughing man it. is Roughing just it. not what he, <laughs> not what it's cracked up to be. All right, Josh has pulled ahead. <laughs> I think a lot of that was on the bar muscle ups. Josh was able to do yeah. a couple bigger sets. Yeah, burpee speed too here a little yeah. bit. Like yeah. Katie, as she's getting tired, you you see now she's standing all the way up and that little pause on each side. I mean, that's not a criticism. That's just something that happens when you right. get fully fatigued. Is your patterns can't stay as fast and you just you're figuring out how to keep move. Now the best of the best, like whoever would 
win this workout on the elite female side might be able to just do have a little bit less of a deterioration just be able to do a little bit less steps but um there's probably always going to be some deterioration yeah. because these athletes can't specialize in one movement they're right. specializing in like racing with however many thousands of combinations could come up in a crossfit race i really love how josh has he started to break these up, but his rest breaks have stayed really, really short. This one's probably his longest one, but before he did six, he took three steps back and then went right into it, and then he finished his set there, and then obviously it was probably about, I don't know, 12 to 15 seconds before he started his bar muscle-ups. Yeah, just an overall shout-out to him, too. He like, obviously qualified for the games this year after a lot of years of work, and uh, he's been really good at this yeah. camp. He's done yeah. really well on a lot of the events and definitely... Uh, I think hopefully built his confidence going into the games knowing that he can compete with some of the best in the world. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, he's really impressive. I met him back in, man, it was probably 2013 or 2014 at regionals and uh, was super impressed with him then, just like his attitude and demeanor. And, you know, his, his goal then was to make the games. And yeah. obviously, you know, this is a uh, something that people can stay motivated with. It took him, you know, five yeah. years from when I met him and yeah. he, he finally did it. So stick with your dreams. So finishing round four, this is round five start. So now you can see Josh is like staying low. It's like this is what yep. a finishing kick for an athlete should look like. If you have the ability, getting into the end of the workout, things are starting to feel awful, but you can hear people yelling, the crowd gets louder, you know that the end of the race is coming, and that's when really there's a ton of separation. In yeah. the last, it's literally like the last three minutes of a workout create a ton of separation on the leaderboard, and this is what people are trying to train for at the games. And especially in a qualifier setting where it's an AMRAP like this, every rep could be, a, you yeah. know, in the open, it's 100 spots, 200 spots for a couple of reps. Yeah. So being able to sprint finish at the end, having a little bit left in the tank, yeah. or even, like even yeah, if you Katie's don't. there yeah. sprinting too. I mean, they're both probably pretty red line, but yeah. they're still able to do it. So yeah. I, I mean, that's that's what I'm trying to train, you know, all yeah. of my athletes for. And I had a conversation with somebody at the end because he, he just blew up and kind of slowed down. Like, you've got to learn to be able to get that kick. And yeah. it's so important. I mean, look at Josh you're just crushing just these flying, yeah, yeah good really, really good awesome finish one thing i did notice he got one no rep for stepping up his burpee that is something your like cognitive intellectual functions start to break yeah. down when you're under fatigue and practicing trying to maintain your movement standards when you go into that final push is something that definitely would save you i mean that one burpee three seconds could have been one or two more snatches and then that actually does matter on yeah, the leaderboard for sure but i think these were uh Two awesome performances, good demo for you. Let's go out onto the floor and we'll uh, run through the rest of the scores. All right, so you saw Josh and Katie in the demo. Josh took second in our training group and Katie actually tied for first in our training group. Best scores, Chandler, he had one muscle up in round five. So he was just six reps ahead of Josh, which was finishing the dumbbell snatches and finishing one muscle up. The scores ranged down all the way to me at last place. So this is two reps shy of three rounds. And then for the girls, this is 10 burpees into round five. So four rounds plus 10, and then goes down to Deb, who was in the fourth round of burpees. So she did three full rounds plus burpees. Hopefully that gives you a context for setting up your pacing strategy. As always with the throwdowns in the description, we have a warm up, we have movement standards, and we have a scaled version of the workout. Thank you very much yes, for pulling me through do. that. Cool, perfect. <laughs> One of the things we always like to finish with is just some long term development tips. The two things that you kind of notice in this workout is most people are limited either by the muscle ups, which is kind of yeah. the obvious one, and then the power snatch technique. Most yeah. people just like, they ended up going like threes or fours the entire time and getting blown up on those. So when you pick up the dumbbells, it's really easy to just kind of muscle snatch it. But one thing people can start to think about is how can I make this a little bit more efficient? And a little dip or a power snatch with the dumbbells actually makes a lot of sense. It would be like picking up a 135 pound power snatch for a guy and doing Isabel and just muscle snatching the whole thing versus power snatching. Yeah. The muscle snatch is gonna blow you up at some point. It feels good and it's fast the first 10 reps, but then if you have to do 30 for time, it's a lot harder. And yeah. then bar muscle ups, a lot of its technique work, keeping a tighter midline, all those things that a coach obviously could help you with. Yeah, so all the stuff we do in this video is to help you with maximizing your ability right now in this workout. But if you need help with coaching, we do have coaching slots available, or you could try our online group training program, The Design. Go to trainingthinktank.com and check those out. It's a wrap, you know what I'm saying? Your boy Project Pata in this thing, man. Hey, look, man, thank y'all for watching Training Think Tank YouTube channel. Y'all hit that motherfucking subscribe button, you know what I'm saying? So y'all go ahead, man. Thank y'all for watching the channel, you know what I'm saying? Hit that motherfucking subscribe button. Let it be known what it be known what it be known, you know what I'm saying?
Ta-ta!